the Spiritual Brew Pub Podcast. We'll help you navigate spiritually after or during a belief shift, deconstruction, or crisis of faith. Not to try to convert you to a particular destination, but give you the resources you need to evaluate your future belief or unbelief and help you follow the religious historical evidence wherever it leads. I'm your host, Michael Camp, a recovering conservative evangelical, the operative word being recovering, sharing my journey and helping others rebuild faith or a reasoned philosophy of life. So grab your brew of choice and learn how fact-based history helps us both critique and rethink faith. Why do we call it a brew pub? Because we like to hang out in them, at least metaphorically. A pub is a great place to let your hair down, share your true thoughts about your journey, and discuss things with an open mind in a non-judgmental environment. Welcome everyone to the Spiritual Brew Pub. I'm your host, Michael Camp. Today we have a wonderful guest with us, Janet Kellogg Ray. She is uh, the author of uh, an incredible book called The God of Monkey Science. People of Faith in a Modern Scientific World. Janet is a science educator who grew up a creationist. She holds a PhD in curriculum and instruction with uh, 18 years of university science teaching, both biology majors and non-majors. Janet, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, and you're from, you're, you're from Texas and live in Texas now. Is that correct? I am with just a short sojourn in Atlanta. I've been in right. uh, Texas my whole life. Okay. And you must be a Cowboys fan, I imagine. Absolutely. <laughs> Huge Cowboys fan, lifelong. All right. I'm not going to hold you. I hold it against you. I'm a Pats fan. But uh, um, but fun fact for me and you, uh, my son is an avid Dallas Cowboys fan, so he's rooting for you. So. Oh, well, that's good because it takes <laughs> perseverance to be a Cowboys fan. Yeah, that, these days, that. right? I told, yeah. I told my son, you picked the wrong era to be a Cowboys <laughs> fan. You should have done it when I was when I was a, a, a sad Pats fan, right? So, um, okay, well, we're going to have a great conversation today. Um, you have a tremendous book that helps people debunk pseudoscience on, uh, uh, out there and particularly around vaccines. COVID-19 conspiracy theories uh, and climate science. Um, uh, you also have a fascinating story, uh, a former or creationist uh, to someone who accepts evolution, um, which is one of the reasons I, 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 had, I wanted you on the podcast. Um, we're going to be talking about everything from the creation evolution debate, a little bit about intelligent design theory. I'm anxious to hear your take on that as I have some pro and con things to say about that. Also, uh, we'll talking about we'll be talking about how evangelicals uh, went from uh, pro vaccine uh, in years past, never a problem with it, to many being uh, anti vaxxers today, as well as doubters in climate science. So um, let's get started. But I thought we'd begin by hearing some of your uh, your background. What's your what's your religious background? And in a nutshell, how did you kind of come? To be a, a you know a creationist as a growing up and then now a science educator who remained a Christian but now believes in evolution. Well, I was raised in uh, the Churches of Christ, which uh -huh. is a conservative, probably fundamentalist wing of evangelicalism. Uh, the church of my growing up years of my uh, was absolutely central to my family's life. Uh, all of our friends, our social life revolved around what was going on at our church. Uh, we went to church three times a week, rain or shine. And uh, I often say the most scarring aspect of that upbringing, upbringing was the fact that I never saw the Wizard of Oz until <laughs> I was until I was an adult, uh, because back in the day. Yeah, that would have been a fun fact right there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> because back in the day, before streaming and recordings, uh, Wizard of Oz only broadcast once a year, and it always broadcast on Sunday night. That's and right. So it was always I, Sunday night. Yep. I never saw it. 
And so, you know, it, I honestly don't remember ever hearing evolution uh, being denigrated from our pulpit uh, because creationism, uh, specifically a six day um, mm -hmm. young earth version of creationism was just the default. And we would have no more have questioned that then we would have questioned the existence of Jesus. Right, but right. I, I definitely remember my first questions. I had absolutely zero vocabulary to express those questions. But I remember the first time I felt uncomfortable uh, with that understanding. And I was in middle school or junior high, as we called it. And believe it or not, in the 70s, uh, science was not required for seventh graders. It was an elective. Uh, and I had decided that I wanted to take choir because it sounded fun. But unfortunately, or fortunately for me, my dad was a teacher in my school. And he is very, and still is, very organized, uh, very triple type A, and he didn't like the lack of discipline that he saw right. in the choir room. So he signed me up for the science class, the I science see. elective. Okay. And I, to this day, credit him for changing the trajectory of my life. Right. Because despite the fact that we didn't require science, my school was a new school. It was kind of an experimental school. And I loved it. It fit a nerdy schoolgirl like me. And this seventh grade science class was amazing. We worked our way through all the different animal kingdoms, as we called them at the time. Um, and I discovered that there were things that were animals that were not puppies and kittens and cows and horses, that these earthworms and these star, these sea stars and these grasshoppers are also part of the animal kingdom. And then as we did these dissections, you know, real life ones, not the right. virtual ones that kids can opt out for these days. But I was discovering that there appeared to be connections between these very disparate um, groups of animals. That it, it looked for all the world like these systems had just been modified from a more um, a, a simpler form to a right. more complex form right. and that all of these things seemed to be connected. I, but I had, no, again, I had no yeah, vocabulary to express that, yeah. that. No, I had no say. Right. I took those same questions into high school and then I went off to university, a Christian university, by the way, which I loved and still love to this day. I was a biology major and I distinctly remember in, in one of my first courses, a professor who ended up being my favorite for professor. I took several mm -hmm. classes from him. I taught labs for him before I graduated. He just pointed out the section in the textbook and said, this is about evolution. You need to know it. Right. End of story. And I got a biology degree, as did my husband. We were in the same university. And that is the extent of our evolution education. So fast forward, we become, uh, you know, young adults, life happens. And I had just siloed things off in the back of my mind. You know, I never I never was truly on board with the young earth business. I didn't have much right. of a problem with that. Um, but I just kind of did things like if I can close one eye and squint the other one, can I make the days of creation match Genesis? <laughs> and, and I just went with there. Well, another after the my dad volunteering me for the science class, uh, the second big milestone that changed my trajectory uh, happened a few years after uh, my husband and I both graduated from Abilene Christian University. There was a young earth apologist with no connection whatsoever to the university decided to go after the careers of two of the professors longtime professor, oh, really? professors yeah. including the guy that was my favorite professor right. and he went in with guns 
blazing, uh, accusing them of all sorts of things where you can imagine donors, alumni, everything was stirred up. Um, this would have been in the probably late 1980s. Um, right. okay. And so one of the professors was a tough old guy and he survived the storm. Uh, but the, the professor that I had taught labs for was a very gentle man, mm -hmm. um, very humble. And it just destroyed him. Wow. He, was, okay. he was humiliated, humiliated. Right. A couple of years ago, I was ash actually asked back to come to my alma mater and speak about my first book about evolution in yeah. chapel of all places. So I'm happy to say the story has a wonderful ending, ending for yeah, Abilene right. Christian. Right. But um, unfortunately, um, oh, what I was going to say is I was able to speak to a, a professor who was there at the time when all of this happened. And what he said was the ironic thing is, is that Dr. Manis was so conservative religiously. He really, squeaked, but wow. he was a man of science. Well, and he, yeah, he yeah. had begun teaching evolution in the classroom. So unfortunately, uh, this professor passed away a broken man, not too oh, many years sad. after that happened. That is a sad story. It is a tragic story. Well, it, 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 really... it, it changed my trajectory. You know, from that point yeah. on, I read, I studied, I investigated on my own. I started writing. It didn't take much because I had, as I said, I'd had these questions since I was 13, 14 years old. Right. Um, and so I, for the first time, really read the evidence I listened to, to speakers. I sought out people of faith who accepted evolution. I started writing, uh, started with a blog. I, I taught a bit uh, as I was asked to at the church I attended at the time. Admittedly, I saw it was a soft sell. Um, it was more of an introduction to this is what this right. says. Um, and then I wrote uh, a, the first book a couple of years ago about uh, Christian denial of evolution. And then, as you said, coming out this fall is the God of monkey science. And right, along right. the way, I went to grad school, got a Ph.D. Um, I started teaching 18 years ago at the University of North Texas. And the rest is history. Right. Well, well, that story really uh, brings out a, a point of, that I have observed you know, as a former evangelical, is that evangelicals picked a war on evolution. And they, whether they were a young earth creationist or an old earth creationist, they were still warring evolution. But it just, it's so sad to attack someone like that. And it turns out the guy is a religious <laughs> conservative. Absolutely. Himself. Yep. And, and so it just, just proves the point that these evolutionists aren't sit sitting back in some, you know, smoke filled room in the back going, OK, how can we uh, uh, misrepresent the data here so that we can attack the Christians? You know, it's like, right. <laughs> now there What's are their nefarious plans. Right, right. Now, there <laughs> might be a few, a handful of, uh, you know, like devout uh, uh, fundamentalist atheists, I call them. But m most of them are not like that. Um, uh, uh, anyways, the, that, that, the next question I want to ask you is, you know, how would you describe you know, because some people just go, oh, you know, you can't believe in evolution. They might say, you know, you have to uh, believe in a single or at least a relatively close in uh, uh, close in time miraculous event as the only way that God could be responsible for creating the world. I mean, how would you push back on that? And, you know, how did, how did you integrate your faith with the acceptance of the theory of evolution? Well, first of all, I, I, I like the way you put that with my acceptance of the theory of evolution. I don't believe in evolution. I don't believe in science. And I always tell my students that on the first day of the semester and everybody looks like they want out of that class really fast. Um, because what, how I explain to my students is, is that a fact is a fact, regardless of whether I believe it or not. So when it comes to evolution, I accept the evidence for mm -hmm. evolution. And so when and, and also and also I make the point that there are a lot of things in my life that I believe 
Um, I believe in that my family loves me. I believe um, in my faith, but that does not mean that I don't accept science evidence. And so to those who have pushed back and, and, and to say that that is a position that is uh, not possible uh, to be a person of faith who accepts the, evolution, the evidence for evolution, um, I just like to, to, to ask the question, you know, why do you feel that a natural explanation for life, uh, including humans, is demeaning? Yeah. How is it demeaning uh, to have a natural expl explanation for something? You know, for example, uh, here in Texas, we desperately need rain and you see on the the church signage you see it on facebook pray, pray for, rain, for rain pray, pray for rain, rain. and yeah. if we get a couple of drops that evaporate before they hit the ground everybody is thanking god for mm -hmm. the rain which yeah. is a fine thing to do it's an appropriate thing to do however we completely understand that that rain came to us through the water cycle and there is an explanation for how the rain came to us. Uh, another example is that people uh, consider a child coming into their family uh, to be a blessing, a miracle. You know, it's, it's something for which they are thankful to mm -hmm. God. But we completely understand whether a child comes into a family by birth or by adoption, that that child came into the family uh, through a, a nine-month embryological process that brought that child to that family. No one would ever say that child is less than because that child was born of a nine-month biological process. And even further and back, if you want to talk about the ovum that existed in the child's mother before. Right. Right. And so I don't understand, you know, this idea that somehow evolution demeans God, that evolution demeans right. creation, that right. evolution demeans human beings. You know, what are we? You're saying we come from monkeys, which is not true. Um, but as if that were something demeaning. And so I have come to a place where I'm quite comfortable in saying that nothing that's discovered in science will cause me not to believe in God. It's not going to be science that is going to wreck my faith. Even if we uh, find evidence for abiogenesis and we find a definitive process by which abi abiogenesis occurred. Uh, if we discover multiverses, nothing that is found by science, no scientific evidence is going to challenge my faith. You know, right. conventional, you know, I, I, and I don't feel like I have to prove God using science. Yeah, you know, there's yeah, there's all uh, just a couple of weeks ago, someone sent me a, a social media meme with two columns. And on one side of the column was things that supposedly ancient people believed about science. And on the other side of the column was things that supposedly the Bible says uh, about science that were true, but nobody knew in those days. So therefore, we have proved God. Yeah. And, but the, the problem with uh, rationale like that is, number one. Um, ancient people did know the, the earth was round. There was a librarian at the, the famous Library of Alexandria that mm -hmm. measured the circumference of the earth. And so, first of all, you know, that's not true. Right. And second, what about all the things in the Bible that are scientifically incorrect? Yeah. And so we get into a lot of trouble really fast if we try to prove God uh, looking for God in science somehow. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. I think one of the distinctions I've made is that sometimes people who are really upset with evolution 
I think one of the main attacks is that it, uh, it, it, the, the science is saying it's, it's the Bible isn't correct about, you know, the literal seven days, the Bible isn't correct about, you know, something else like, Oh, there couldn't have been a worldwide flood or whatever. And so they're really nervous about discrediting the Bible. Right. Mm -hmm. Which I, in my, in my view is, is really, uh, misguided because of the nature of the Bible. It's not a scientific right. book. It does have some problems in it just because it has all kinds of ancient literature right. uh, before the sci modern science era had, or right. philosophically, you could argue that it's a problem. I mean, I, mean, I, I critique it all the time, but, right. but there's many inspirational things in the Bible too. But there's this kind of like all or nothing. If you find anything that's wrong, yes. Yes. It, it, right. With the Bible, because of science or whatever, then they're up in arms and just you guys are just terrible people for right. for doing this. Right. So right. I think that's one of the distinctions, don't you think? And I think we would probably find out that maybe we're trying to figure out why uh, if people are anti-vaxxers or something, does that real that doesn't really seem to attack the Bible or or climate science doesn't really seem to attack the Bible. So, you know, what what is the difference between back in the day, evangelicals did not have any problem with vaccines. Right. What, you know, what has changed? What, you know, you, I mean, they, my, my dad was always pro-science, mm -hmm. et cetera. Well, uh, but all of a sudden today in the last, you know, in the age of COVID, I've seen so many people that I would never have dreamed would be anti-vax and they're anti-vax. And they believe a lot of conspiracy theories. What's the yep. difference? Well, you're exactly right. Uh, it used to be that evolution was the only bad guy. And yeah, uh, right. yes, and so people of, of faith uh, could fight evolution uh, and, and still get their childhood vaccines and mm -hmm. be on board with anything else. You know, scientists used to be our heroes. They used yeah. to be our heroes. If you think about the race to space and, and things like that, um, but no longer. And so we have to, though, in order to trace back, how did we get to where we are today? We have to look back at what started it all. And that was in the 1920s, the scopes, what's called the scopes monkey trial. Right. And right. so at the time of Scope's Monkey Trial, which in which it was it was a whole setup. Um, that's a whole other story. Uh, but the idea was um, a, a man was being accused of teaching human evolution in public schools and which was against the law. And so you've got to understand that Darwin's theory of evolution had been around for decades prior to this, mm -hmm. but it had not made its way into the consciousness of the common people. It right. was it was in the precinct of scientists. And then you also brought up about um, understanding and critiquing and looking at the Bible. At the same time Darwin was writing, there were primarily German theologians who were also looking at the Bible as a uh, through the lens of historical and literary criticism. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so what we have at the end of the, of the 19th century was this perfect storm of scientists who are telling us that we came from monkeys and we've got these um, elite intellectuals in their ivory towers telling us that the Bible is not the very literal words out of the mouth of God. Right. Uh, but again, it really wasn't part of the consciousness of the common man until we get into the 20th century and it began uh, to be to be talked about from the pulpits. And then we see the Scopes trial. So it's important to understand that although this trial was about teaching evolution, not a single scientist testified yeah, during the Scopes trial. Yeah, no science evidence was right. entered into testimony. But instead, uh, William Jennings Bryan, the, the prevailing attorney, who was known as the great commoner, he was a popular orator of the day. Uh, if he were alive, he would today he would have his own talk radio show, probably. 
Uh, he spoke the language of the common people and not the language of science. So when he made his argument against evolution, he said, there's no evidence for evolution and even scientists don't accept it. Uh, he characterized the people who accept evolution as enemies of the Bible. Right. And right. then here is a big one that uh, leads us to where we are today. Uh, Bryant argued that since those who are against evolution are in the majority, if evolution is taught in schools, their rights are being violated. And so fast forward to uh, through the rest of the 20th century into the 21st century, and we've taken those same arguments and we've thrown them against the pandemic, against climate science. You know, when I was researching this book, it was almost like uncovering argument fossils. Uh, we're still saying the science evidence is sketchy or wrong. We're still saying science threatens God. Um, and we're still saying that acceptance of some of this science evidence comes at a cost of our personal rights and freedoms. And so what was interesting, you know, to me is that as we find ourselves here in the second, no, third decade of the, 20, of the 21st century, we're not debating photosynthesis. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not arguing about gravity. You know, evolution might have been the first science that offended Christians. But in the 21st century, it seems to be this package deal, as you said, along with vaccine denial, right. all things COVID and climate science. So why are these three, these big three right now, part of a package deal. Well, again, we have to go back a few decades, uh, this time to the late 70s, early 80s. Right. Um, uh, people up to this time would, who were religious would have considered themselves creationist. But in the late 70s, 1980s, early 80s, uh, creationism was rebranded. And it is here at this point in history that the modern version of creationism was born. Um, and so what we see coming out of this modern version of young earth creationism is the beginning of all these organizations and institutes dedicated right. to researching, publishing, and teaching creationism. The initial goal was to frame creationism not as something religious, but as science. And this is where we get the term creation science. That right, came out right, of the right. early 1980s. Right. Uh, but it wasn't long before these institutions uh, born out of this new creationist movement and dedicated to having creationism be seen as a science uh, found that they could not do that. They could not uh, find evidence, science evidence for young earth creationism right. uh, that could stand toe to toe, you know, with evolution science and geology that said the earth was ancient. So because these organizations could not disprove evolution, they switched gears. And instead of trying to promote creationism as science, evolution was then framed as the root of all cultural evils. It was the right. root cause of abortion, homosexuality, yeah. school shootings, disobedient children. Right. You know, it was easier to blame evolution for the culture uh, than it was yep. to prove it false. Yeah, and so, and so, it's not it's not a surprise that when science became a front in the culture war. You know, the science community has always been suspect because they wanted to make our children atheist. But now in the 21st century, they not only want to make our children atheist, but now they want to shut down our churches. They want to stop yeah. our public assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, they want us to take a vaccine instead of trusting God. 
as our protection. So what's next? What else would the government and its scientific minions try to make us do? And then when it comes to uh, the evidence for climate science and trying to ameliorate some of those uh, bad outcomes that we see on the horizon, we see science threatening our very American way of life. Uh, science is threatening our gas cars and our gas stoves, even our ceiling fans. And so we took our initial arguments against evolution and re retooled them against climate and vaccines and COVID. But where we really found um, the, the push to among people, communities of faith, particularly in evangelical precincts, was this idea that science is a front in a culture war. It's right. always been in evangelical precincts about standing up to the world, standing no, up to culture, right. David versus Goliath. Yeah. You know, and we always see ourselves as the righteous underdog. Right. And so when COVID vaccines and COVID came into our public understanding and climate science came into our public understanding, we were geared up and ready to go. We had the arguments for, for from fighting evolution for so long. And then the 1980s, the fight for creation, creationism was reframed as a culture fight and off we went. We no, were off totally to the races. Yeah, you can see that progression, and uh, it's very clear. But the, the the other part of it is that also evangelicals have always been programmed to not trust outsiders. Oh, so, absolutely. So yeah. you cannot trust anyone who's not a born again Christian or an evangelical right. or if they're too right. liberal, if they're a Democrat, if they're right. well, if they're a scientist who believes in evolution, we certainly can't trust them. So so there's all this mistrust, and it started, you know, with just distrusting evolution but then it slowly uh, evolved in a very at the end it kind of very quickly evolved into this what you're calling all-out culture war Absolutely. even things like climate science and mm -hmm. and vaccines etc mm -hmm. it's just a phenomenon that just just blows my mind before right. we get into more and about the covid and climate science so i have one more question about uh you know the uh, i'll just frame it this way uh, there's young earth creationists who believe the earth is very uh, young, 6,000 or 10,000 years old, because of what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And then there's old earth creationists who recognize that the earth is very old, even, you know, 4 billion or whatever it is, but they still uh, don't believe in evolution. And then uh, those folks usually start um, talking about intelligent design theory. So um, I have, I don't I would just say that I have pro and con things to say about an intelligent design. And I, I might call myself an intelligent, I believing in intelligent evolution. In other words, if you believe in God and you still see the science of evolution, you know, how did God, uh, you know, uh, in, in during the process of evolution, how are there interactions that move that along? How did, like you said, the wisdom and the, and the intelligence behind the creation how did that work? Now, some people might say it worked through intelligent design uh, of, of interventions, let's say, uh, of God. Um, but other, you know, other people, or like Francis Collins, I, I assume that you're an, an evolutionist in the in the realm of uh, in the sphere of Francis Collins. How would he? You know, he might have another way of describing it. So, where do you come down on that? On intelligent design specifically? Yeah, how would you, you know, w w is there a place for, let's say, uh, talking about evolution as, as like intelligent evolution, somehow uh, uh, seeing some things from ID theory that, you know, makes sense and could be attributed to God? Uh, or what is the, uh, what's another way of looking at it as a, a, a Christian who believes or accepts evolution? Well, the first thing I would like to say is that I make a distinction between capital letters, intelligent design, and a lowercase um, idea of there being an intelligence or 
a wisdom or a logos underlying and sustaining creation. Uh, right. when, when we talk about intelligent design or intelligent design theory, uh, that is almost always referencing a specific group, a specific group uh, of um, institutions, writers, uh, promoters, apologists. It's a, it's a specific way of looking at um, the development of life on our planet uh, that that goes beyond just accepting a a, a wisdom that underlies and uh, sustains creation. So, you know, I, I do have quite a few problems with the capital letter intelligent design movement. Okay. You know, first of all, I I usually refer to it in my writing and speaking as intelligent design creationism or uh, the intelligent design version of creationism. Because in reality, uh, if you did a Venn diagram, there would not be a lot of area that did not overlap. Um, intelligent design is often just a way of defending uh, creationist views. Now, I will say, um, I've never run across an intelligent design advocate that believed in a young earth. So uh, I will say. Oh, they no, are, there are. They're, they're very oh, they're, many. Most of oh, them are. Yeah. Well, I that, well, I, I would say. But there, no, there, are, there yeah. are some that do still believe in young earth, but a lot of them don't believe. In, well, uh, I guess yeah. what I'm thinking of are the big uh, ID institutions. You know, the, they yeah. are not. That's not going to be part of the big publishing houses. Uh, for intelligent design. Um, but I would, you know, first of all, I'd just like to point out that um, advocates for design uh, like to use the verbiage intelligent design theory or the theory of design. Well, as a science educator, I have to just stop right there and say one of the definitions of a science theory is that a theory predicts new knowledge. A, predict, a, a, a scientific theory predicts new evidence. Well, if life as we see it on our planet, the, from down to the cellular level, is the result of a design known only to the designer, oh, which by the way, um, the design, intelligent designs, organizations and publishing houses, they uh, quite often do not refer to the designer as God right. uh, because they want to be seen as this alternative theory to yeah. evolution. So mm -hmm. I, I'm using I'm using the verbiage of these writers right. and advocates. So if design if, if what we see, if the complexity that we see in living things and down to the cellular level is due to a design, a special design, tinkering by a designer, and this design and this tinkering is known only to the designer, mm -hmm. why research? Mm -hmm. How do you predict? You can't predict. There's no prediction um, a, a, a possible. Mm -hmm. If you are chalking the complexity up to a tinkering of a designer or a specific design that's known only to the designer, intelligent design does not meet the criteria for being a science theory. Um, and then there's just problems with the idea of a designer being responsible for life on Earth. You know, we all want to um, to talk about, uh, for example, the miracle of the human body. You know, we have this mm -hmm. chemical and this chemical. If they didn't right. work just together in this specific way, then right. the whole thing would fall apart. So we right. love to credit um, a designer which is God, um, we, a designer. We love to credit this designer with what we see as these miraculous, wonderful aspects of life. Mm -hmm. 
But if we create, if we credit the, de the designer with things like this, what are we going to do with all of the broken genes that are littering our um, genomes? Yeah, yeah right. Genes okay. that are broken that in the same way as broken genes found in our close evolutionary kin. Why would a designer insert broken genes? And why would a designer insert these broken genes in a way that looks for all the world like common ancestry, that uh, life evolved uh, right. via right. common ancestry? And then we have to just quite honestly look at bad design. If the human body was designed, there are some very bad designs, and there are also some deadly designs. You know, uh, an engineer looking at the, the human back will say it's an engineering nightmare. Um, <laughs> all the different curves in our, in yeah, our spine right, that yeah. result in back pain for so many people, debilitating right. in, in, some, in some instances. Uh, we have uh, the same pipe that handles our food and our air, uh, which is why people die from choking on our food just from doing something every day like eating a sandwich. Uh, childbirth through a human pelvis is not a good design. And mm -hmm. for centuries, for actually most of human history, it's been a, a, the leading cause of death for women uh, mm -hmm. because of this design of childbirth going through the pelvis. We have deadly, other deadly, you know, if you want to call it a design, things like uh, the genetic uh, gene, the gene that makes humans uh, resistant to malaria is also the gene that causes the d deadly disease, sickle cell disease. Sickle cell, right, right. Right. So we always want to credit the designer with things that we um, see as good, but no one wants to credit the designer with bad design, right, especially yeah. deadly design. And right. then, you know, uh, uh, intelligent design advocates will say, well, yes, we can do research because um, there are all of these things in the cell, for, ex if, for instance, is mm -hmm. unexplained. And mm -hmm. so it's so complex. Uh, it, it's never going to be explained. We have to chalk it up to a designer. And the phrase you will hear is irreducible complexity. Right. Yeah. Things I'm are so it. right. That things are so complex that they could, there's no way they could have come together um, through a random process like evolution. Well, first of all, evolution isn't always random, but we'll set that aside for now. But what do we do as people of faith? If we hold on to this idea that God tinkered, at all of these steps uh, along the way. And so that's why we see complex things that we can't explain. So what do we do when those questions are answered? Right. What do we do when it is explained? Uh, we have just put God back to the back of the line. And so, you know, and probably the, the last thing that I would say, especially to those um, who are still advocating for, uh, you know, creation science, uh, intelligent design as an alternative for evolution. You know, just a simple question. If there is so much evidence for uh, a young earth or special creation or design or even a literal global worldwide flood, then why do we never see non-religious scientists touting it? Why are, are there no um, peer-reviewed articles by non-religious scientists advocating for design or instantaneous special creation? If it truly was there, the evidence is there. Scientists love to prove each other wrong. Right, right. Uh, if you could debunk evolution, you would, you know, get it, get on the plane now for your Nobel Prize because you're <laughs> going to, you're going to win it. Um, yes. uh, but there's just not any, not religious. It's a lot of negatives there. I'm sorry. Right. There's just you just don't find non-religious scientists 
writing peer-reviewed articles, making, uh, doing research to support instantaneous special creation or design. Yeah, I think, I think that um, uh, certainly the instantaneous uh, instant creation type of, I, what I find in the ID camp, and I'll just say this one question, then we're going to move on, okay? And this one okay. thing is that there are some uh, non-religious uh, people in ID, but they still are basically believing in evolution. They're kind of like maybe an intelligent evolution, they might say. But they say that there's there, the, the evolution is, is still there, but it's different than, you know, certainly in Darwin's day, it's, it's changed in, and there are, you, you could still argue that, and that's kind of like the, the problem I have with the ID camp is that they don't, they really have a lot more in common with someone like Francis Collins and yourself, but they can't bring themselves to, to, to go there because so many, so most of them have a religious agenda, although some of them don't. So it's, it's an interesting phenomenon in my view. But let's pivot because we've kind of gone down this rabbit trail of evolution. And I want to focus uh, the rest of our time on what's happened in the COVID era. So tell us, uh, uh, in your book, you go through how the COVID-19 vaccine was developed. You talk about Dr. Kazmekia Corbett, uh -huh. who developed the more Moderna vaccine. So tell us about that. Just how, how that happened briefly, and then what's your case for why we, we, why we can trust the COVID vaccines? Well, you know, the, one of the biggest um, arguments uh, and hesitations during the whole COVID pandemic about a vaccine, even before the vaccine was released, was the speed at which the vaccine was being developed. Right. But what we have to understand is that RNA vaccine research was not new. Coronavirus research was not new. Uh, the SARS and the MERS, if you recall mm -hmm. those, yes. were both caused by coronaviruses. Neither of those reached uh, a global pandemic like COVID did, but they were in the same category, a related category of viruses. Well, uh, Dr. Kismekia Corbett uh, was a young woman, a brilliant woman. At the time of the COVID uh, coming into our consciousness in the early, late uh, 2019, early 2020, uh, Dr. Corbett had been at the National Institutes of Health for five years a young mm -hmm. researcher just making all sorts of headway, getting lots of attention. Um, she was definitely uh, a person uh, to look out for in the area of uh, vaccine development. Well, Dr. Corbett for five years had been studying uh, the MERS and the SARS viruses. Specifically, she was studying those spike proteins that we heard so much about that are found on the surface of coronaviruses right. that allow coronaviruses to attack and to infect a cell. So that for five years, five years, Dr. Corbett had been studying these spike viruses found on the surface of coronaviruses. So when uh, 2020 hit and we saw that this thing was going to be really big before the rest of us even knew it was going to be really big, um, Dr. Corbett was asked to switch gears and start looking at the COVID virus. Mm -hmm. And so because of her, her work for the past five years, she already had the genetic code for the spike proteins uh, for these other coronaviruses. Right, right. You had a head start on all this. Right. And what Dr. Corbett said was it was basically plug and play, which mm -hmm. may be a, a gamer term. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not a gamer. But she said it was basically plug and play. And she said it only took her a few hours to plug in the coronavirus spikes for covid the genetic information there. And so once she did that, she shared that information with Moderna, who had been working on 
these mRNA viruses. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. unbelievably, within in less than two months, just about six weeks, we're talking mm -hmm. about here what I described to you, mm -hmm. about six weeks, the first human trials for the Moderna COVID vaccine, these mRNA vaccines right. went into a uh, study, the first yeah. human trials. And so that just scared a lot of people to death because it seemed like this was just too fast. Yeah. This mRNA technology, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about something that's going into my cells and, 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 and it just sounds scary because, you know, we've seen Gattaca mm -hmm. and all the movies that, that scare <laughs> us about, about uh, RNA and DNA and all the other nucleic acids. Um, and so from our perspective, uh, outside uh, epidemiology and immunology and infectious disease, it seemed like it happened at lightning speed. Um, when in reality, it was built, the, the mRNA vaccines were built on years of research. Right. So, but because of this plug and play ability we have with this genetic code, and because of, uh, we had spent five years trying to develop vaccines uh, for SARS and MERS, it seemed like it was overnight. And, right. you know, yeah. traditional vaccines uh, have been usually relied on weakened or killed viruses to promote an immune response in the body. Well, it takes time to grow vats and vats and vats and vats and vats of viruses that can then be weakened or killed. And so we didn't have to do that with these mRNA viruses. It was a whole different approach to delivering uh, what was going to promote or to provoke an immune response in the humans. That's interesting. Um, uh, another thing that uh, you brought out in the book, and I really like this about the book, folks, this is, you know, what she's doing is she's, she's saying, okay, what's the backstory here? Here's what you hear. Here's the, <laughs> here's the conspiracy theory. Here are the, the concerns and the fears, but what's going on? And most people didn't know about this woman who, had a head start on this vaccine. And there was a good reason why it happened quickly. And then they went into the first uh, human trials and and went, went from there uh, to develop the vaccine. But there's also this story about, we saw in the news during that time, this group called the American Frontline Doctors. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Dr. Simone Gold. Yeah. Uh, and so... You know, I, I have some friends who are anti-vaxxers, and that was one of the things that they brought up. Oh, you know, check out these guys, people. They're real scientists. And they're, you know, the thing that really bugs me about this whole conspiracy theory is that in order for it to be true, all these public health scientists have to be conspiring. It's just like the evolution thing, right? They're back in the smoke-filled room going, yeah. how can we plan a pandemic? You know, right. how, how right. can we? How can we make va vaccines dangerous and actually kill people? Kill people. Right, know. right. I mean, like crazy. <laughs> that's in the Hippocratic Oath. There we go. Yeah, 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 right. So that's what has to be true for these conspiracy theories to be true. But tell us about American Frontline Doctors. You know, what's the backstory with them? And why are there claims of dangerous vaccines and ivermectin being the better way to go and all this stuff? Why isn't that not based on good science? Well, you're right. It happened early in the pandemic. It was at the beginning of what we didn't know at the time was going to be about a three-year experience. So early in 2020, this group of doctors calling themselves America's frontline doctors right. uh, assembled on the steps of the, the Supreme Court of the United States. So yeah, imagine, so yeah, yeah, imagine the optics of this. You have mm -hmm. this group of 20-ish doctors all wearing their white coats, starched white coats, you know, the universal symbol of a medical professional. And they're on the steps of the Supreme Court, which is a at least a national sim symbol of respect. And here's the key word, authority. 
a respect right. and authority. So the optics were all in place and that this was touted as a press conference. And so there were a couple of doctors, uh, Simone Gold was one, and there was one or two others that spoke uh, for the group. And the, the alternative or the drug of choice at this point was hydroxychloroquine. And these doctors who spoke claimed to have cured hundreds of patients with hydroxychloroquine. So despite what you hear those scientists over at NIH telling you, don't believe them, believe us. We have cured our patients with hydroxychloroquine. And so one intrepid, um, I guess, a member of the press at this um, particular press conference spoke up and asked, have you published your data? Yes, right. Have you published your data? And one of the doctors replied, you know, basically, my data are not important for you to see. And another one of the, the doctors, I believe this was Gold, replied, not everyone needs to publish in order to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And so I also have to tell you that on the first day of every semester, I put a photograph of America's frontline doctors oh, yeah. <laughs> on the steps of the Supreme Court right. up on the screen. And we talk about what makes something good research. How do scientists work? What makes something science? What uh, is suspect? And I will tell you, even freshman uh, students in their first college biology class. You should see the looks on their face uh, because we've already been talking about the, uh, the prior in this uh, class time about what makes a good science research study. And then I tell the story of America's frontline doctors. And even these freshman students, first semester of their college experience, uh, can spot the red flags of right, bad right. science research. Right. What, what are some of those red flags? Of, of what the bad America's... Of sci yeah. Bad scientific research. Well, specifically in this case uh, was the fact that it was all... Uh, these doctors were saying um, what their claims were all anecdotal. Claims yes. based on... Uh, their own observations. And so anecdotal claims, uh, there was no peer review. Nothing mm -hmm. had been published, even, even put out as a, as a, as a paper before mm -hmm. it was published in a peer review journal uh, yeah. for other doctors and researchers to see what their claims were. Uh, we have no idea uh, the size of their experimental group. We have no idea if they controlled that group. Did they control for um, other possibilities? You know, there's just all sorts right. of, of red flags. Now, um, I will say that at the beginning of the pandemic, we were all desperate. It became very uh, clear quickly that we were dealing with something that most of us had not dealt with in right. our lifetimes. And so there were actual science studies, some by the NIH, some by private um, universities using private research money, but across the board, including in the universe, uh, the, uh, the United Kingdom, using their national uh, health plan uh, data that they have, uh, looking at the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, which right. came on the scene right. a few months after hydroxychloroquine right. was the drug they don't want you to know about of the hour. It then also became ivermectin. So now, what they, you're is while they were saying, oh, we've got the cure, right? Right. Other scientists were are, were studying this to yes. confirm, hey, this could be, a, it could be. Exactly, a let's, exactly, let's make exactly. Sure it is. And it they, wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't that it was right. It wasn't like scientists were ignoring right. anecdotal evidence, but yeah. 
interestingly, the hydroxychloroquine studies were shut down very quickly. Uh, and not because it was dangerous, but because it became clear almost immediately that there was no difference between taking hydro hydroxychloroquine right. and a placebo. And yeah. there was no reason to continue all right. of these large double blind controlled studies. It's the same with ivermectin. Uh, when there was anecdotal information that ivermectin um, was killing the COVID virus, we found out it was killing it in a Petri dish in levels that would be toxic uh, right, to, to, right, any, level, to any right. human. Right. Yeah. And so it wasn't that these were looked at. Uh, they were. They were they, researched. They were, but, yeah, they but, were but, looked at. They, right. Right. They were, Ignoring them, right. Right. But what these America's frontline doctors were doing were getting up in, in, in using and showing all of these aspects of authority. And I talk more about that in the book, uh, you know, contrasting authority versus expertise. And right. this is a prime example of that. They had all of the trappings of authority, white mm -hmm. coat, doctors right. on the steps of the Supreme Court. But what they did not have was expertise in the field. They were not infectious disease docs. Right. They were not researchers. Um, and so it's it, they were outside the medical community's consensus of yeah. uh, opinions on and, these two particular and drugs. I, and I would add they weren't doing proper research. They were, were cutting exactly. corners. <laughs> exactly. And and what I found interesting doing research for this book is I did not know it initially. Initially, I'm just like, wow, they are just really uh, presenting a lot of bad science. You know, that was my first um, impression of this group when they came out. But a deeper dive uh, and I discovered that this was not a group of doctors, disparate doctors that, hey, I'm doing this, you're doing this, we're all doing this, let's kind of get together. And, and right. you know, we could call ourselves America's frontline doctors and, and we could be a help. And no, 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 that's not how the group started. Uh, this group was actually of America's frontline doctors was actually created by an organization a politically right-leaning organization that had its roots in that hyper-conservative takeover yeah. of the Southern Baptist Convention of a few yeah. years ago. So wow. this was a this was a group that was um, not put together by chance or by accident. This group was put together with a purpose. Yeah, and with a, as with a, and yeah, and agenda. as the in the agenda, absolutely. And as the um, pandemic wore on, when all of these large uh, studies came out showing that uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin were not effective, mm -hmm. uh, the leader of the group, Simone Gold, continued to speak in churches. Yeah, churches continued to invite right. her and she continued to, to promote these um, alternative treatments and to advise against taking a vaccine that was soon to be released. No, that, that's incredible. And, and I think the conspiracy theories broadened from there to, um, uh, you know, denigrating Dr. Anthony Fauci. Right, and right. All kinds of right. nefarious motives behind, right. supposedly behind him and, yep. and Yep. And I don't know, I remember people saying, well, you, you have you ever heard of VAERS, V-A-E-R-S? That's, that's got all kinds of things in there that's evidence that the vaccine is, is harmful. And, and then you, when, I, when I researched it, I found out, well, yeah, but that's, that's just reporting things that they can, as a base, so they can research it to see if it actually is harmful. It's not just, you know, it's, it's not the end all of all uh, conclusive. Is that right? Uh, it, it bars exactly. Me. When you have something that's self-reported, yes. self-reported like VAERS, and I'm not saying it's not um, a valuable uh, data point, right. but when you, are, when you are making your entire case built on VAERS, you have self-reported um, mm -hmm. 
vaccine experiences. And so what we don't know is the person who self-reports is, I had uh, my COVID vaccine and I was immediately, I felt sick. It was horrible. And then I passed out and then I ended up in the emergency room. So therefore COVID vaccine is bad. But what we don't have from the self-report is that this person was a type one diabetic and they didn't take their insulin for that day. You know, yeah, it, right, it's, yeah, it's right. not a controlled situation yes, right. where right. you're controlling for other, exactly. um, yeah. other no, outside it's, factors. It's, that bad, might... it's, just a, it's a bad research. If you rely on that for your conclusions, that's bad research. Basically. Ab absolutely. And there right. is a reason why the best um, science studies are double blind which means neither the um, participant nor the researcher knows who is getting the treatment. Uh, uh, yeah. no, someone's got it written down somewhere, right. but no one knows because human nature will, uh, will play a game on our mind. And that if we get the treatment or if we get a vaccine, you know, if we're, if we're afraid of the vaccine, then we might feel bad after we get the vaccine. We may feel tired. We may feel shaky. Our hearts may race. And, you know, if we've got a placebo and was told it was a vaccine, uh, we if we are going to respond that way because of our fear, we would respond that way to a placebo. So right. th that's yeah. why right. scientists double blind their studies. But you're exactly right. There was nothing that you know I have ever seen about the denigration of scientists during the COVID pandemic. You know, like I said earlier, scientists used to be our heroes, and there was no one who was denigrated more than and Anthony Fauci, Fauci, Fauci at, Fauci, at yeah. the time. Yeah. You know, yeah. he was called all sorts of things, but you know, flip flopper was one of the big ones. Yeah. Flip flopper, yeah. you know, he speaks out of both sides of his mouth, but. Um, you know, uh, again, uh, just going back to what makes something good science, you know, early in the pandemic, um, we didn't know it was a novel coronavirus and we called it novel mm -hmm. for a reason because it was new. So early in 2020, we were not sure if asymptomatic people could spread the virus. We were pretty sure that they could, but we didn't have enough studies yeah. in to know if asymptomatic people. Also at the time, we were not ready with medical equipment for a global pandemic. So we, you could not go to the local CVS and get a box of masks for right. yourselves. And so before we knew if asymptomatic people could spread the virus and when everybody was hoarding toilet paper and paper towels, we weren't sharing. We weren't being very good at sharing. Dr. Fauci said, there's no reason to mask right now. Let's save the few masks we have for our medical personnel, which made perfect sense. So when two or three months later, when the studies were coming in, and we realized that asymptomatic people could indeed spread the virus, Fauci came back and said, everyone needs a mask. Right. Do not go out without a mask. And oh, the world just yeah. ended. The world <laughs> no, ended. No, Fauci, yeah. Fauci lied the no, first yeah. time. Fauci right. is lying the second He's time. Flip He's flip-flopping. <laughs> you know, but that is what science does. Yes. No, Science it makes, it makes perfect changes sense. its mind with new evidence. And, but this, you know, the, this, the new evidence, it's right. He's not he, based on the evidence. I know this is the best advice I can give you next right. week. I got new evidence. OK, right. I have right. My advice if I'm honest. <laughs> right. And that is what you said right there. What you just yeah. said is exactly why we love pseudoscience. Because pseudoscience provides certainty. Drink this supplement and your migraines will go away. Uh, do this detox program and you will feel better than you felt in your entire life. Pseudoscience gives us certainty. Think about the, the doctors on the Supreme Court steps. I've cured 
all these patients with hydroxychloroquine. Science, on the other hand, never speaks in terms of certainty. Um, you won't see in scientific literature uh, the word prove, uh, because to say proved means we've learned everything and there's nothing more we will ever find out. Science yeah, just does not speak in terms of certainty. Yeah. Science, science speaks in terms of this is the best evidence we have right now. This yeah. is the consensus of the field right now. And, you know, as human beings, we crave certainty. So we drift toward pseudoscience and yeah. we and we accuse our scientists of being flip floppers, liars and worse. No, it's true. And and the other thing is that the science is not is not 100 <laughs> percent. Right. Oh, yeah. So not that the vaccines are 90 or 94 percent effective. Uh, yes, there are some people that if you have these conditions, you probably you shouldn't take the vaccine. Yes, you know, there are side effects, but if you get the disease, it's going to be worse. And, and, and you know, you, there are all these, these statistics and everything, and, and you're trying to explain it to people. Right. And, and some people, like you said, they just have to have everything fall in line. And it's, I think it was just the, the cult of, uh, of denialism and conspiracy theories that took over and people started stopped thinking reasonably about the whole thing. It's just, it was just crazy. Right. Right. So, um, well, we're running out of time, Janet, but, um, we haven't had a chance to get into some of the other things that we were going to talk about, but I'll just let people know that in your book, you also talk about, uh, something called the Wakefield study of the uh, MMR vaccine and how mm -hmm. that, that theory was debunked that uh, no, there is no tie with autism and, and that vaccine. There's also, you go into climate science and, and some of the denialism that's going on there and why we can trust climate science. So you've got a lot of good stuff in there and I want to encourage people to uh, get the book and check out Janet Ray. Um, uh, she's got uh, not only an, uh, an interest, very interesting story of her life, but also some really good uh, wisdom about how to how to approach science. One last question, <laughs> make it quick. But what what do you think is the best way for someone to be true to both their faith and science? Well, you know, I would just start by saying that we've got to understand that if people of faith deny demonstrable empirical evidence we have just completely taken ourselves out of the broader conversations i mean who's going to listen to us you know when we speak to science who's going to listen to us who cares about our take on things if we are denying empirical evidence you know i am probably well no not probably i am not going to listen to a flat earther uh, right. tell me about the best way to approach climate change i'm yeah. just not going to do it and so when we deny science as people of faith we're we've just taken ourselves out of the conversation out of the conversation and so you know, we just admit we have nothing to say about it. You know, we can pretend it's all a conspiracy. We can say it's all po politics or we can speak as people of faith, at, you know, as a voice into uh, modern science. And, you know, right. people have asked me, you know, what, what does that look like? Well, you know, it looks like, OK, evolution is a fact. Humans share ancestry with all life. So. Given that fact, how do we rise above our natural evolutionary instincts to put ourselves first? Um, we say, okay, germ theory is real. Germ theory is a fact. So given that fact, how can churches best serve in the time of a deadly pandemic? Right. Uh, do churches need to take their contribution money and hire attorneys so they can keep their buildings open for worship <laughs> services? Or do we need to use our resources to help our, our communities and our neighbors who can't work from home or who live in multi-generational What's the best way to houses? love our neighbor yes. and, 
and uh, get out of this mindset of like, you know, this is the only way to worship God and to love our neighbor is to be in this Absolutely. building. I mean, that, it's just incredible how right. narrow minded that is. It's just right. amazing. And this is actually a sobering question to me. You know, we can lead, but if we're not going to lead, we can at least get out of the way. Um, we know that evangelical Christians, specifically white evangelical Christians, were the leading demographic, about 40%, who were resisting precautions and uh, not wanting to take a vaccine and, and being against right. vaccination during COVID. So I can't help but ask myself the question, how long was this three-year pandemic extended because this huge demographic mm -hmm. refused to mask, refused right. to stop meeting in great groups, in large groups, or refused to be vaccinated. You know, we got in the way. We Not only did we not lead, we got in the way. Yeah. And I, I, I think we need to um, do some serious thinking, some serious soul searching about um, the role of people of faith in a modern scientific world. Yeah, and the, and the, a good place to start is to read Janet's book. Yes. <laughs> so I'll put that out there. Thank you so much for being with us, Janet. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's been a great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. It's been a great, great questions. I loved it. Right. Okay, folks, that's it for this episode. Until next time, enjoy responsibly.